Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you as we uh, hit this weekend. It's the first time since 2003 that the Super Bowl has not been held on the first Sunday of February. So the expanded NFL schedule, I guess, caused a little schedule change, if you've noticed. And so a few people are up in arms because you have the Super Bowl the same weekend as Valentine's Day weekend, and a couple people aren't happy about that, apparently, online. And But Pastor Tim has an idea here. I got an idea. Have no fear. So here it is. At your Super Bowl party today, have next year guacamole some red roses. See? It works. You got it? Or try this. During the commercials, instead of yelling to your significant other, hey, grab me a soda, you say, please grab me a soda. I mean, I got all kinds of ideas for you guys to help make a mashup of Super Bowl and Valentine's Day. The reality is, this weekend, the biggest thing happening is not a game where there's a battle of teams. It's not about a somewhat manufactured holiday to celebrate romance. The reality is, as we gather today, as we worship, we worship the Lord who has declared the greatest victory of all time. We worship a Lord who loves us with an everlasting love, and we're going to spend some time in God's Word, uh, checking out what that means for us as followers of Christ, as Paul will say, the body of Christ. We've been in this Ephesians series, um, this Paul's letter. He's writing from prison to these Christians in Ephesus. And following his introduction comes these verses 3 through 14, which we've been spending a few weeks on, this glorious 202-word run-on sentence from Paul where he's exploding with praise for God for all that God has done in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And what Paul then does, he follows up with the prayer in verses 15 through 23, and he continues what I'm calling a Trinitarian formula. You're going to notice Paul saying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is one of nine times in the letter to the Ephesians that Paul uses this formulation. And it's a prayer to God. And what he does, he gets a little bit better about his run-on sentences because this is a single sentence of 169 words all mashed up into this one prayer. So he's improving his run-on sentence abilities. In 15 through 23, these wonderful verses, I want to sum it up like this. Paul begins with this word of thanks for their faith in Christ. And then what he does, he tells them that he is praying to God for them. And I share Paul's heart in that. He's praying for this family of believers in Ephesus. And what he does, he introduces this idea of the church as the body of Christ. And we'll spend some time in later weeks focusing on what does that mean, that we are the body of Christ. And he ends this prayer section by praying for the church. And he says this, he says, which is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. A really big, grandiose statement in verse 23. And what we see is Paul's prayer of gratitude toward this family of believers. It mirrors my own heart of gratitude for my CPC family. In the same way that Paul is praying for them, I am praying for you. And so as you hear these words of Paul, I want you to hear this as a prayer for us, the CPC family. Because Paul was recognizing their faith in the Lord and was recognizing their love for all the saints in this prayer. And that's what I see here at CPC. I see that as we've supported Nancy for over 30 years in her missionary work. I see your love for all the saints. I see your faithfulness in the Lord. And I'm going to be praying for you, our CPC family, as we lean into this section of the scriptures today, that you would know three things. That Paul is praying that we as Christians in verses 18 and 19, that we would know God's hope, that we would know that we are God's inheritance, and third, that we would know God's power, hope, inheritance, and power. Take a look in your Bibles if you have them open, verse 18, because Paul, as he says his prayer, he wants, he says, what is the hope to which he has called you? It's having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know this hope to which he has called you. He wants you to know hope. The first thing that Paul's pray, that he prays for is that you would be a people who would reorient your life around this hope that is found in Christ. 
this reality about God's present reign and, yes, his future. It's not just we're waiting to die and go to heaven, but no, right now you have hope. God is here with you, and he has a plan for you and a purpose for you. You have hope right now. And because we know how the story ends, we can have hope for living today, even though today can have a lot of trials, can't they? We can live differently as Christians because we have ultimate hope both in the future and right now. And we need Paul's prayer that we would receive eyes that can see. That's verse 18. See, because Paul knows that these Christians in Ephesus, they're having trouble seeing this hope. They're having trouble seeing the reality of God in them. They were surrounded by all kinds of other so-called powers that seemed to be more influential than the God they worship. And I don't know if you've ever felt like that. You read the news, you open up your email, and you just get overwhelmed by bad news. And so Paul's words to them are needed by us today. We have a hope of God in us. God has already won the victory. and He's working out everything in the end, everything that's happening in the world. God says, I'm in control. And so I know we're hearing lots of bad news about Ukraine. I know. We're hearing lots of bad news about potential you know, nuclear growth in Iran right now. I mean, there's all kinds of bad news out there. And we have bad news in our, in our families, right, amongst friends. In the midst of that, Paul is speaking to us a word of hope that is real, that is in you. See, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, Paul is praying, that would enable you to see with new eyes that our daily lives have purpose and meaning, that our eyes could see this hope that is found in Jesus Christ. And so we pause after we sang a couple great songs and we heard a wonderful testimony and we have some great opportunities for us to to worship and fellowship and serve. We pause and, and we ask ourselves, do we know this hope in Jesus Do we know it? Right in the middle of your circumstances, and maybe some of you are saying, well, Lord, I'm waiting for the Lord to remove these circumstances so I can have hope. No, no, that's not how it works. In the middle of your circumstances, Paul is saying you can have hope. Hope in him right now. Have new eyes to see. See the power that raised Jesus from the dead 2,000 years ago and the power that enthroned Jesus at the right hand of the Father. That same power lives in you by the Spirit today. Do you see it? Do you have the eyes? And that's why Paul prays in verse 18, for your eyes of your heart. That's a very unique phrase. In fact, We don't see it in any other of Paul's letters or writings. We don't see it in any other book of the Bible. We don't even see it in any other ancient manuscript. Paul makes up this phrase, prays that the eyes of your heart will be able to see and to know. And what is he praying for you first? Hope. Do you have hope? Oh, God wants to give you eyes to see the hope that you already have, that you already have access to. See, the Christians that Paul was speaking to didn't fully comprehend the incredible hope that they had at their disposal. And we can reveal our challenge with that too. Maybe we're like the church in Ephesus because as we ask ourselves, what am I afraid of? What am I worried about this week? It reveals where our eyes are having trouble seeing hope. And so Lord, help me to see with new eyes your hope. My friends at Union Rescue Mission are working with a young woman named Ramona. I used to be on the board of Union Rescue Mission, works in LA Skid Row amongst thousands of thousands of men, women, and children living on the streets. My friends at Union Rescue Mission house thousands of people every night. They raise money for that. They feed them, give them education, and they also share the love of Christ with them. And Ramona has an incredible story And she's now trying to find her new identity in this God that she is learning about. Ramona says this. She says, my mom was pregnant with me while she and my dad were living on Skid Row, getting high and doing drugs. In fact, she gave birth to me on a couch in Skid Row while snorting lines of cocaine to ease her pain during labor. And as a result, I was born addicted to coke, meth, and heroin. Eventually, my grandma adopted me, so she was my mom, and did everything for me, but that didn't last long because she passed away when I was just 14 years old. 
And so from there, I went from foster care home to home to home, place to place, bouncing around with incredible uncertainty. My circumstances drove me to intense depression where I turned to alcohol, drugs, and hanging out with the wrong crowd. And Ramona goes on to share how she has experienced a lifetime of trauma in her very short, young life. She never knew that she was loved. She never knew that she was valued. She never knew that she was wanted. And now for the first time, as she is escaping life on Skid Row with my friends at Union Rescue Mission, she's beginning to learn about a Christ who is talking about a love, and she's recognizing it's a love she has always been looking for. She's realizing, slowly but surely, she's not worthless. That she can have hope for her. Someone with her background, she has hope. She's learning that she's God's treasure. I hope we'll be praying for our friend Ramona in the weeks to come, that she would know fully the hope that is in Christ. I want to be praying for you, for anyone listening today, if you don't know the hope that is in Christ, that you would discover that. And that you would even discover that you are God's treasure. Look at verse 18 again. Paul continues saying, praying not only that you would know his hope, that you would know God's inheritance. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance amongst the saints? Now, Paul not only prays for believers that they would know God's hope, but also this part, that you have an inheritance in God. But he's actually praying for something else. He's actually praying that you would know that you are God's inheritance. We were talking about this a couple weeks ago because Paul uses this word inheritance in kind of an interesting way because in verses 11 and 14, we see Paul talking about this inheritance. It could actually mean it, the inheritance we have in God, the inheritance of his love, the inheritance of eternal salvation in him, the inheritance of the Holy Spirit being a deposit in our lives. These are all wonderful riches that we receive from God when we put our faith in Christ. We're saved by grace. That's a wonderful inheritance, right? Paul's talking about that in verses 11 and 14. But what is even more clear in verse 18, Paul's actually shifting the direction of the inheritance. And what he is saying is not so much that you receive an inheritance when you put your faith in Christ, though that is true. What he is saying is that because you put your faith in Christ, you now can know yourself as God's inheritance. Are you hearing that? <laughs> that you are his treasure. That Ramona is hearing for the first time in life that because of Christ, she is a treasure. I don't know what your resume looks like. May you're saying, well, my resume is nothing like Ramona's. It's much cleaner than that. It doesn't matter. All of us are broken, aren't we? All of us are lost. You may have tried to make yourself look clean and important and successful. I'm sure you are, but there's going to come a time in your life when you cannot rely on all of your efforts or all of your other human inheritance or your reputation or resume. There's going to come a time we face Jesus face to face, and he's going to look at everyone's resume. And the only resume that's going to matter is the one who's put their faith in Christ. Because you know what the Bible says? That at the judgment day, God's going to look at our resume. And if we know Christ, Jesus slips in our resume, his resume instead of ours. He takes away our imperfect resume full of sin and, and fickleness, right? And our hearts that are, that are sometimes turning away and sometimes we're good and sometimes we're bad. And in Christ, Christ gives us his perfect resume. And God says, welcome home. It doesn't matter how good you've made your resume. We all are only found to be having eternal significance when we put our faith in Christ. Do you know this Jesus who offers you that? Because in Christ, you are God's inheritance. See, in contrast to the other provincial rulers that the Ephesians knew, the, the gods and the goddesses of the temples where they lived and they worshiped, these capricious gods that they had to make sacrifices to, sacrifice to make them a successful in life, successful in love, successful in business. They never knew where they stood with these gods. They never knew where they stood with their government either. And in the middle of that Paul is saying there is security that you can know that only comes from Christ. 
And in that, we, God wants you to know that you are valued as his inheritance. You not only get one from him, God says when he looks at you, he looks at you and Ramona and even Pastor Tim with eyes of love. I don't know who needs to hear that today, but that's a truth right from God's word. You're God's priceless inheritance. Isn't that amazing to think? I mean, imagine, you know, Elon Musk, this billionaire who built something called uh, Tesla cars, that guy. Imagine, uh, you know, he's single again, so if you're looking to connect with a billionaire, I don't know if he's a Christian, but, um, but what would you buy Elon for his birthday? What would you get him? That'd even be remotely kind of impressive. What could you buy him? And you think about that, like, what could you buy the Lord to impress him? What, what, could, you, what could you gift God, right? And he tells you right here, well, yourself. That's what he wants. He wants you. You are his inheritance. He treasures you. See, knowing my identity in Christ sets me free from having to prove myself to anyone else on this earth that I'm valuable, that I'm lovable. I don't have to seek after power or possessions or praise of people anymore because I know what my God thinks of me. That's only because of Jesus. Paul begins praying for these people. And he prays in verse 19. He wants to pray for them to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. So Paul not only prays that they would know the hope they have as God treasured inheritance, but that they would know God's power evidenced in the resurrection of Christ. You see, the Ephesians lived in this culture where literally they had principalities and powers. Ephesians 6, verse 12. It was an everyday experience for them where they, they could be local governors or rulers or the gods or goddesses that they were trying to please. Everyday life was affected by these powers. And so the Ephesians are very aware of all the different powers that were in their life attempting to control their world, and they were trying to find their own power in order to control their lives. Anyone here struggle with trying to control their life? This diet, this acquisition, this job, this relationship, if I just had that, my life would finally be what I want it to be. We're just like the Ephesians 2,000 years ago. We're looking for a solution to my problems. I need more power. I need something to control my life. And so we turn to things to improve our lives. We turn to fad diets or plastic surgery, self-improvement techniques in order to improve our lives, control our destiny. Some of us here, we know people who turn to other spiritual powers as well. A recent poll found that some 62% of Americans are seeking spiritual connection through astrology, from energies in nature, from psychics, 62% of Americans. What used to be something more on the fringe has now become the norm. We're seeking power from these other things. And it's not that there's not power in those things, but friends, that is not the ultimate power or the true power. Well, these other things are distracting us from the one true power from God revealed in Christ. See, Paul claims the greatest display of actual power that humanity has ever witnessed, it's found in verse 20. It's when God raised Jesus from the dead. Isn't that amazing? The death of Jesus leading to his resurrection is the ultimate sign of power that Paul is telling Christians to put your attention on, to know that power, not these other things that have a little bit of power or even a false power, the true power that comes in God through Christ. The Ephesians were susceptible to feel hopeless amidst very real dark powers of magic and idol worship. That was their daily lives. And these Christians who came out of that had an inferiority complex, most likely, when they thought about the great Roman Empire or they thought about all these spiritual powers that are resisting the church. And Paul reminds them that there is a greater power within them, and his name is Jesus. He lives in you. And Paul prays that the eyes of their heart would be able to see the reality of the hope and the power that they have at their disposal 
that you are God's treasured possession. You have not been abandoned. Regardless of your circumstances, there is hope, not just for the future, but for now. Where do you need to see God's hope and power in your life? This week, can you think of it? A relationship, a health issue, your bank account. Lord, we need your power. God is not just like a slot machine or he's not a Santa Claus, but he's a good God you can go to and say, Lord, I know this power is available to me. Help me to see with new eyes, though, and turn to you first, as opposed to all these other ways I'm trying to control my life. Lord, help me to see with new eyes. You see, when we ask God to give us these new eyes, that we will begin seeing that God has an enemy that is fighting against him and fighting against you, an enemy that is working against his church, that church that is trying to bring this hope and to bring this healing to the community and to the world. Can you see with new eyes? There's an enemy that wants you to keep your eyes closed. You know, I'm supposed to have my annual eye checkup. I missed it last year. So things are kind of fuzzy. So I kind of see out there, and sometimes I say, oh, hey, I don't know who that is. You ever skipped an eye appointment because your eyes are a little blurry? Paul is praying for your eyes to get a good checkup, to get a clarity about who you really are and what the reality really is. And when you open your eyes, we're going to start seeing our friends and our family, ourselves, and how we succumb in this world. We see the power of alcohol and the power of drugs, the power of addictive behaviors of all kinds. And their addictions are as much as spiritual as they are physical, aren't they? Because there are always powers behind the powers. Powers behind loneliness, powers behind depression, powers behind despondency. And so Paul's point isn't to make Christians scared of the powers, but to make them aware they have a greater power over all those things. And so I want to avoid two things today. One thing would be that we talk about spiritual forces in such a way that we see the devil behind every bad habit, the devil behind every problem in our lives. That would be one extreme. And the other extreme is that that we would see in our lives that we don't even have a need to pray, that we're so in control of our lives. That's not needed. And how can we see the very real circumstances and the very real powers that are working against us and say, Lord, We need to see your power work in our world and our lives. Work in this sickness, work in this bad habit, work in our bad experiences, which are real. We need to rely on God's power to propel us into his plans. Lord, what's your plan? Show us your way, Lord. Do you ever feel stuck? Do you ever even struggle to pray? I want to tell you a true story. This uh, Last year, a a man came and shared. He was a guest speaker at the city's annual prayer breakfast, and his story is as follows. In Vietnam in 1971, an interpreter, his name was Hien Pham, he was raised as a devout Buddhist. And one day he was given a Bible by an American soldier, and he became interested, had some questions. He actually found a church in his community, and so he went to this church to hear more about this Jesus. And in the process of that, he learned about a Jesus who loved him. And he left Buddhism and became a Christian and asked Jesus to become his Lord and Savior. Well, uh, he and believed and, and accepted. He started growing as a Christian. He became an energetic, very devoted believer. And he ended up working closely with the U.S. military at that time. And he was a civilian. But he knew English so well that he was able to be of immense help to them and also to work with missionaries in the area. And so within four years, though, as you know, Vietnam fell to the communists, and Hien eventually was arrested. He was accused of aiding and abetting the Americans, and so he was in and out of prison for several years. And during one particular long jail term, the sole purpose of his jailers was to indoctrinate ideals in him, indoctrinate him against the West and especially against democratic ideals and the Christian faith. And so he was cut off from reading anything in English, and he was restricted to only communist propaganda in French or Vietnamese, the two languages of the country. Hien, eventually during this prison term, began to buckle under the onslaught. Maybe he thought, I've been lied to. Maybe God does not exist. 
Finally, he made up his mind. He determined that when he awakened, he would be done with all of this Christian stuff. He would never pray again. So the next morning, he awoke, and he was assigned to clean the latrines of the prison, pretty much as a punishment. And as he cleaned out a tin can filled with toilet paper, his eye caught what he thought was English printed on one of the pieces of paper. And so he hurriedly washed it off and he slipped it into his hip pocket and he planned to read it at night. And under the mosquito net that night, he pulled out a small flashlight and he read the top corner and it said this, Romans chapter eight. And this is what he read. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or dangers or sword? No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither the present nor the future, nor death, nor life, nor angels, or demons, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then he and Pham began to weep. Who knew there was not a more relevant passage of conviction and strength for someone on the verge of surrendering to the threat of evil? And so he cried out to God for forgiveness because this was going to be the first day in years that he was going to not pray. The next day, he and asked the camp commander, can I please clean the latrines again? And he continued to do this chore on a regular basis because he had discovered this one secret. Some official in the camp was using a Bible as toilet paper. And so every day, he would go and clean it off and study God's word. And he had a significant portion of the scriptures during this time in prison. The day came when Heen was released and he began to make plans to escape from Vietnam. And after several unsuccessful attempts, he began to build a boat in secret. And about 53 other people planned to escape with him. All was going as planned until one night, a knock on the door, four Viet Cong soldiers show up and say, our sources say that you're planning an escape. Is it true? And he and looked at them in the face and he says, no, it's not true. And he said some things. He convinced them that he wasn't doing that. And they left. First, he was relieved. And then he actually felt convicted. And he said to the Lord, Lord, if they come back, I will tell them the truth. He continued his plans. And the night came when he was ready to escape. And a knock on the door came. Four, same Fort Viet Cong soldier said, we hear you're planning an escape. Is it true? And he says, I must tell you the truth. I am. Are you going to imprison me again? And the soldiers leaned in and said, no, we want to go with you. So all 58 of them go on a boat, escape Vietnam. They hit a terrible storm during their travel. And he concluded his story by saying this. Those four Viet Cong soldiers all happened to be fishermen who were skilled sailors And if it were not for their sailing ability, all of us would have perished. They eventually made it to Thailand. And then he and Pham himself, years later, arrived in the United States, where today he's an American citizen. He's a very successful businessman. He got a a degree from a small school called Berkeley. Then he got more degrees from a small school called Harvard and Stanford. And he said this as he ended his speech last year. He's praying for America. He's grateful to her and praying that she would again open her heart as a nation to Christ and always be one nation under God and embrace her motto, in God we trust. I just want to close by saying this. I know some of us are going through a hard time. I know some of us have our own kinds of prisons, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, financial, (laughs) relational. They're real. And I can't promise you God's going to do for you what he did for this man. I'm just telling you what he did. I'm telling you there's a love that's real, that in Christ you are God's inheritance. In Christ you do have a power. In Christ there is hope. 
So will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that you promise us that you, Lord, have put everything under the feet of Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that there's nothing that is not under your ultimate control. We don't understand why pain and suffering in prisons exist. We don't understand why Ramona had to go through all of that pain. We don't understand why we have gone through so much pain in our lives. But Lord, we proclaim with new eyes that we can see there is hope, that you have a power, and that we are your inheritance. Oh Lord, may that sink in as we worship you in song as we worship you in obedience with our lives that seeks to serve the least and the lost and the last. May we be your people so captivated by your love, filled with so much hope that we actually go out to people who are experiencing homelessness and love on people like Ramona. They would actually have the courage to love our friends in Fresno who are struggling, that we'd have the courage to not rely on these fads and these other things to make us feel in control of our lives, but lay ourselves at you, Lord. And know that no resume that we build on earth matters. What matters is putting our faith in you. So Lord, as we worship you in song, we rededicate our lives to you, the one true hope, the one true power. Lord, thank you that we are your inheritance. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.